want to ask you, uh, because anyone covering foreign policy and, and covering wars as you did for so long obviously has to deal with in all sorts of ways the U.S. security state, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and sort of how it influences a lot of these policies. There's no way to understand one without the other. After 9-11, we saw this series of whistleblowers from within the U.S. security state, people like William Binney and, and uh, Thomas Drake, and of course culminating with Edward Snowden, who all had the same grievance, namely that you know, the whole foundation of this secret part of our government that would act without democratic accountability and outside of any transparency would be that the one taboo would ever be turning their power inward to manipulate the American population and the domestic population. And a lot of them came forward primarily based on their grievance that that was the thing that they thought would never happen. And they were seeing that more and more and more and more that almost uh, as much as these, these agencies were focused on foreign governments, they were focused in our domestic politics as well. I know there's been a lot of that since the creation of the U.S. security state, but do you agree that that has gotten worse and more, uh, more evident, the idea that the U.S. security state now plays a bigger role than ever before in our domestic politics? Yeah, it's completely unaccountable and, and you can't control it. Uh, that's the problem. And Arnold Toneby, when he writes about the decline of empire, he talks about these rogue intelligence, military complexes, institutions uh, that essentially can no longer be regulated, uh, can no longer be constrained. Uh, the you know all of the people who led us into the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Libya, uh, you know there should be accountability. There not only is there not accountability, but the same people who are leading us into the disasters in Ukraine and funneling weapons to sustain the genocide in Gaza, uh, and that's very dangerous because. Uh, at the beginning of an empire, empires are very judicious, usually, about the use of force. What characterizes declining, dying empires is military adventurism, where they seek to gain a diminishing or a lost hegemony through mil military fiasco. And I think we can start with Vietnam and go basically right through of just one military debacle after another. What we've done in the Middle East uh, is probably the greatest strategic blunder, um, you know, in American history. You're talking about um, Iraq. So Iraq. I'm talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. and, and, and Syria and Libya. And, but that has had, ra you know, ramifications not only throughout the Muslim world, but through the, in, the global south. The global south is reacting the way it is to what's happening in Gaza because they understand that uh, countries like Israel or countries like the United States, uh, there's, you know, are perfectly happy, especially as we talk about mass migration and failed states from climate, the climate crisis and everything else to use genocide as a weapon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that, you know, there was a moment, I, I'm sure you remember when Feinstein did the torture report, remember that? Not my favorite, you know, senator, but nevertheless, and then she came out ashen and the CIA had like hacked the computers and she gave this very chilling press conference that basically said, you can't confront these people or they'll destroy you. Uh, and, and that's, that's where we are. Uh, and, and that is, that is, you know, the, these people perpetuate, they perpetuate war, they perpetuate surveillance. I mean, I cover the Stasi state in East Germany at the end, I covered the collapse. And it got into, a, you know, it got into a, the, this absurdist point where they, the Stasi were sending informants into retiree stamp clubs to see if somebody ever made a joke about the dictator Eric Honecker. I mean, that's the point that you get, but it calcifies the entire countries. It atrophies the entire country, uh, not just the press, but any form of fe freedom of expression, any capacity for uh, democratic, uh, you know, participation. We don't have democratic participation. Look at the DNC. I mean, it was, uh, you know, a choreographed burlesque show. Um, so uh, it, 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 it's a symptom of, of late empire, and it's very, very dangerous. And I think, of course, you have done a pretty good job of calling these people out. You know, it's funny. I, I remember, and this left a lasting impression on me, when we first started doing the Snowden reporting, early on there was a report about how the NSA was spying on even allied world leaders. We did reporting on how they were spying on the then president, Brazilian president Dilma, Dilma Rousseff, but the biggest splash was made when they, uh, when there was a report that actually didn't come from the Snowden reporting, but it came out at the same time that the NSA was spying on the personal telephone devices of Angela Merkel, the then chancellor of Germany, supposedly a great ally of the United States, 
And in a call she, she made to President Obama, she expressed indignation. The Germans leaked this and made clear that a lot of her indignation came from the fact that she grew up in East Germany under the Stasi and yeah. this kind of was redolent of what she thought she had escaped. And I remember very well that they had interviewed Stasi operatives and intelligence officials after that conversation happened and they said, we could never have dreamed of having the kind of you know, right. ubiquitous surveillance that the NSA has developed as a result of the internet. We were able to maybe intercept 20% of conversations if we're being aggressive at the peak. And, and here you're talking about essentially gathering um, everything. Let me uh, just shift gears a little bit uh, because you, you referenced before the kind of group of people responsible for all those war and terror abuses, not just Afghanistan and Iraq, but Guantanamo, the whole system of detaining people with no due process, torturing them, right? kidnapping off the streets of Europe and sending them to Syria and, and Egypt to be tortured, putting them in CIA black sites to purposely keep them away from human rights organizations, the atrocities of which we're only now hearing about. And as you said, a lot of those people, most of them, in fact, didn't suffer any consequences from any of that. In fact, they're thriving most. And we used to call them neocons. You could almost call them Kamala surrogates at this point. I mean, the vast majority of them are right. now actively on the side of the Democratic Party. And sort of the, you know, final expression of that was when Dick Cheney, who just 20 years ago, liberals routinely described as this Hitler figure, this grave threat to democracy, war criminal, came out and said that he was endorsing Kamala Harris. And when asked about why, Liz Cheney said, oh, it's not just because we hate Trump, it's because we actually feel like the Democrats and Kamala's foreign policy align more closely with our foreign policy worldview than a Trump-led GOP. Um, personally, I think that she has a good point. If I were a neocon who never changed my worldview, I think I would feel very comfortable as well in the modern day Democratic Party. What is your view about what this reflects? The fact that just 20 years later, after depicting all these people as bloodthirsty monsters and war criminals and accusing them of having stolen the 2000 election, we now have no memory of that, no history prior to Trump. And, and it's not only that Democrats are eager to accept their support, but that they feel so comfortable, more comfortable in the Democratic Party. Well, let's be clear. The Democratic Party in Europe would be a far right party. Um, what, what's happened in the United States is that, and this was largely done by Clinton and Biden, uh, is they transformed the Democratic Party into the traditional Republican Party, and they pushed the Republican Party so far to the right it became insane. Um, and what you've seen with the rise of a figure like Trump, uh, and the, uh, there's a cultish quality, obviously, to the Republican Party uh, around Trump, is that that ruling establishment party has become one party. Uh, and that's why they embrace figures like uh, Dick Cheney. I mean, Dick Cheney should be in prison, um, of course. If Dick Cheney endorses anyone, that's a good reason not to vote for them. Uh, so what you've seen is the establishment turn on Trump. Why? Well, it's not because he isn't going to give Goldman Sachs everything they want. Uh, you know, the, it's, we, we have this insane system, both under Biden and Trump, where the Pentagon submits a budget and then they give, they give the Pentagon even more than the, they ask for. That, nothing's going to, but he's impulsive. Uh, he, uh, he's ignorant. He uh, he doesn't play the game. He's an embarrassment. Um, and so that's why they know. But, but, let me just interject like, there a little bit, because I remember the first time neocons really turned against Trump. It was in 2015. At the beginning of his campaign, he gave an interview where he said, I think the U.S. is too pro-Israel. In order to make a deal, we need to have more credibility as an even-handed player. Two months later, he was at APAC giving the standard or even more radical pro-Israel speech. But that was his instinct. He does things like question the ongoing value or viability of NATO, argues that we shouldn't be engaged in regime change wars in Syria and, and, and Libya and those kinds of things, uh, that we should try and get along with the countries that are authoritarian, which, and to me, it seems like whether he intends to do that or not, and there was a lot of stuff in that first administration that misaligned radically with what he said in the 2016 campaign, but I feel like leaving aside all of Trump's personal attributes and the things he says and does, there does seem to be more trust and faith in the reliability of people like Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, the Democratic Party, to protect these kind of establishment orthodoxies than they trust Donald Trump to do so. Do you think that's part of it as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, he's 
his ideology is skin deep. I mean, he, you know, he ended up moving the recognize the Golan Heights as part of Israel. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, you know, so, but yeah, he's impulsive and he, and, and he says things. I remember when he his first debate, I think he was sitting with Jeb Bush, said that, it, that what everybody knew, but nobody in the political class would say was that Iraq was a big mistake. I can't remember the exact words he used to, or it was disaster or something like that, which it was. So there's an impulsiveness and, and they feel they can't control him uh, so, yes, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I, I think, you know, we've seen Trump. He kind of shifts with the winds. Uh, but, yes, I think that's that's exactly why the establishment is determined and as united. I mean, the whole kind of palace coup itself was, first of all, they wouldn't let anyone run against Biden in the primaries. Uh, and then why did Biden step down? Because the billionaire class pulled the plug. And then as soon as uh, Kamala Harris, no, nobody voted for, became uh, the presumptive nominee. You saw a situation where, uh, she, you know, every week she was getting another two hundred billion dollars or something. Uh, so, uh, you know, the whole that th that's just a small window on, into how decayed the system is. But yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that's right. Yeah, and by the way, that same party, the Democratic Party, is the party which they will tell you is the only salvation for American democracy. Is the only way that if you believe in democratic yeah, right. values, you can preserve it. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.